The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello everyone and welcome to Open. I'm Darren Jaime and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough as well as across New York City. Coming up on today's show, we go front and center with an update of the New York City court system as the restrictions involving coronavirus continues. Afterwards, we'll learn ways to navigate your stress, anxiety, and depression during this holiday season, a troubling time for so many. And then we'll talk about a not-for-profit organization that's providing housing and services to victims of domestic violence, as well as their families. Also, we'll sit down with the director of Bronx Community College's admissions program on registration for the upcoming spring 2022 semester and some courses you don't want to miss. And then finally, we'll discuss the importance of self-care and setting boundaries. We'll give you more a little bit later on in the show. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. Welcome to Open. I am Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, December the 8th. Yes, you're watching Open, a live program that brings the Bronx and New York City right to you. We want to welcome our viewers who are watching live on the MNN channel as Open is being broadcast live simultaneously on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. You can stay connected to us also on our social media platforms at BronxNet TV. And please don't forget about our website at BronxNet.org. Well, several things have been going on throughout the course of the past week. We can't take you through everything, but we can update you with a couple of things with our Bronx updates. We start off with coronavirus news. A vaccination milestone in New York City has been reached quietly. As city residents worried about the Omicron coronavirus variant, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced more than 12.5 million doses of the vaccine have already been administered. Now, Governor Kathy Hochul stated spiking COVID-19 cases this winter season likely will not mean the return of harsh measures such as lockdowns, the difference is now in New York, more people have the vaccine and other less disruptive steps have been taken to fight against the virus. That is all the time we have for our Bronx updates. Stay with us. We are not out of show. The best of open continues right after this. to the show, New York state and federal courts have actually transformed their procedures and operations as a result of the onset of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Now the pandemic not only changed the way courts operate, but also changed the way the lawyers work. Almost a year and a half after the pandemic was declared in March of 2020, many lawyers were still working from home 
many courts were still holding hearings online. Joining us now and sharing more about it is letting us know is uh, the host of today's verdict, our attorney, our uh, legal correspondent here as well, David Lesh, my friend and brother. Good to have you back. Darren, it's always good to see you. Um, it's like being on a, it's like being home when I'm talking to you. It's always just a good feeling for me. The reunion. Um, Don't you ever forget you started here. Yes, you did. Go ahead. <laughs> I did. Um, you know, this has been a it's still a very difficult time, um, not just for for everyone. It's a, it happens to be a difficult time for the for the legal profession. And right now, things are certainly not back to normal for those who are practicing law. And what I mean by that is, yes, I'm still representing my clients and, and advocating for them and moving my files, whether it's personal injury, medical malpractice cases, even guardianship work that I, that I end up doing. But I'm doing it much differently. Yes, I'm in my office right now filming, right? Which is make it, makes it easier in terms of doing the Bronx Net that I do. But the courthouse is, is right across the street on the other side of me in the grand concourse and I'm never there. And I spent a, I've spent a significant amount of my last 32 years practicing law in that courthouse, conferencing cases all day. And you might say, well, why aren't you there? I don't understand that. I mean, if you can go to Yankee stadium, which is down the block and, and watch games next to everybody without masks, why can't you just go across the street in a much you know, quieter setting well, the reason is OCA doesn't really want attorneys back in court anymore um, at a very limited basis. They'll let us try cases. Very few cases are being tried, maybe one at a time. They have to be one of the oldest cases in the courthouse to even get on the schedule. Um, it's not easy to try a case. You try a case with walkie-talkies. Jurors are sit in the... Um, sit in the, in, the, in the area where the audience used to watch the trial. That's where they sit. They don't sit in a jury box. That's too close to, the, to each other. They wear masks. When you wanna have a conference with the judge, you don't go up to the bench. You use this, this mechanism of a walkie talkie. It's a very difficult way to try a case. Well, that's just trials. The, the, the court system doesn't want the attorneys back in during their routine conferences, you know, discovery is not getting done. You're, you're, you're not getting depositions scheduled of your, of your clients. You're not able to take a deposition of the other side. Well, how do cases move? How do they settle if you're not getting depositions done? OCA's answer is work it out. You, you, mm. you're, you're adults, get on, you know, you get on the, on the email, get on the phone and you work it out. Don't come into court anymore and put it on us to do conferences unless you can't work it out, but you must show us a really good faith effort. So my brother, my law partner and I, what we do is we send out these emails to attorneys three months in advance. My client is scheduled for a deposition three months from now. Is there anything you need that's going to prevent you from taking the deposition? And we don't hear anything. Two weeks before the same thing, we don't hear anything. Then we call them for the deposition. They don't have an attorney, they don't show. Now we can write to the court and say, you have to help us out here. And mm -hmm. they will. But if we don't go through those steps, they don't want to hear from us. The courts say, like, don't, don't right. reach out. Well, how frustrating is it for you as a lawyer now, given the fact that you've had to make these kind of adjustments with what's going on? You're used to a certain kind of way. Of, of course, we know that things are changing because of COVID, but yet still it seems as though the changes that you're making are really, uh, you know, they're really extended. And, 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 then, and it's not going back. I, I think that's the, what, what I really wanted the viewers to understand, that this is really the, the new normal in terms of law. Um, I think the judges, you know, have been able to kind of trim off their, off their plate, which is what they wanted to do. Um, they wanted things to run a little bit smoother in terms of um, not keeping people on their payroll that they don't necessarily need. Um, I think they've always kind of been looking for something like this. And there are lawyers who really enjoy this type of virtual work. Uh, there, this has made my job easier in some respects, depositions, conferences, um, even dealing with BronxNet. It's made my life easier. But where is the, the impetus 
to settle a case if there's not a threat of a trial. That's right. how you get money on civil, dis civil litigation issues. Even in criminal cases, you need the threat of a trial to, to, do, to have pleas. And um, you don't have that anymore. So until COVID is so far in, in the back window, this is it. And even when COVID may be completely gone, the landscape of the legal industry will be changed forever, as I think our industry in Bronx that may be changed forever in terms of how we interview people. That's mm -hmm. my thought on it. Yeah, I mean, there, there are going to be some there are going to be some widespread changes. I think the long term effects of this have still yet to be seen as to how we're as to how we're going to deal for yourself uh, and your clients. What's it looking like in terms of getting on the calendar right now? There are people out there who have legitimate cases, but what's the time frame? If, if, if I get into an accident now or something happens right now, I need a lawyer, I need to go to court. What's the time frame I could potentially be looking at right now to get into the courtroom? That's a great question. And, and a lot of it depends on who, who your adversary is. If it's the city of New York right now, you got four years before you're moving this case. I tell my clients that. Four years, because there's such a backlog. And the only reason the city of New York paid on, on, on their claims is they had a threat of the trial. They never really moved stuff very much beforehand. They really didn't. And now there's no threat of trial. So they're just holding on to their monies. City of New York is holding on to their money. That's what they're doing. Now, the private insurance companies, let's say I'm assuming State Farm, Allstate, Geico, well, the attorneys do want to justify their jobs on the other side, so they are trying to move some of the cases, but no, the insurance companies like keeping their money and keeping it in their accounts and investing their monies and making the money. So I tell the clients, you're going to be delayed at least a year what it normally would be. So if it normally would take two years from start to finish, you got about three. I want you to know from the very beginning that if you don't hear from me, it's not because I'm not working on your case. It's just because I don't need you. And I want you to understand that. I want to, I want to temper your expectations. Mm. Hey, let, me get this, let me get this in here about settlements, right? We know a lot of times, you know, clients will settle and it'll be very, you know, very difficult to get to a settlement. Are we finding that settlements are becoming a lot more easier given the fact that we can't get to the courtroom or is it working the other way where, you know, hey, we can delay this out and we don't have to do anything? Yes and no. If it's if the case is, is worth more than a five hundred thousand dollar case, you're going to have a much tougher time moving it, because that's a lot of money, and and that's a lot of money for an insurance company to come up with, and when they know they can hold on to their money. But when it's smaller cases, twenty five thousand settlement, fifty thousand settlement, anything under a hundred, I've been able to move them significantly quicker than I normally would be because everyone's justifying what they're doing for a living, so that I can move. But the heavier ones, and we have some heavy, heavy heavy cases in this office that my brother and I, my father, can't move them. There's no threat to move them. So, but the smaller cases, Darren, yes, I can move those cases. And I will tell I, a lot of times, and this is what I say right to the client. I said, look, you don't have to take the money that they've just offered me, but do you want to wait another year and a half to, to, to get the 10% extra or the 15% extra? Do you really think it's worth it to you to wait that time? And then all of a sudden, you know, the it's like, hmm, you know what? You're right. I'll take it now. You never know what happens. I'll take it now. And they take it. I got to tell them straight up. I said, look, I I'm losing 10, 15% on my fee as well. But we're getting the money. At least we're getting it. Do you want to right. wait a year and a half? And you need it. You need this case. I said, you only have one case. I have another 600, 700, 800 cases in this office that I make a fee on. This is your only case. Do you want to really wait another year and a half for another 10 to 15%? Is that what you want? I can, I can do it, but can you do it? Right. And when I put it that way, they say, thank you. You're right. I'm reconsidering it. Yes, I want the money. That's what Wow. I'm Amazing. Well, Dave, we got to bring it back at the beginning of the year. Let us know how things are going. And certainly, uh, you know, we appreciate having you and sharing and all the best to you uh, during this holiday season, my brother. You know, stay safe, Darren, and uh, I'm going to see you in the studio at some point. I don't know when, but we'll see each other. You know, we've been, we've been saying that. We are we are going to see each other real soon, and hopefully uh, it'll be in the studio and we can get a chance to uh, do this the way we normally used to do it. But who knows? Listen, have a very happy holiday. All right, brother. Listen, you take care, bro. David Lesh, our guest here 
on open and want to let you know now if you want more information please do me a favor you can follow him on twitter at david lesh and then also at today's verdict and then you can get all the information that you want about david and his shows all right taking a quick break got more coming up here on open we'll be right back right after this seem like a time where you just take it indoors for the winter and uh, binge watch. But for about 5% of Americans, what they're feeling isn't a natural transition. People may be experiencing symptoms of seasonal depression, which is a mood disorder characterized by depression that occurs at the same time every year, more particularly the holidays. Now joining us to share more details is the founder and president of the Scudder Intervention Services Foundation, Brett A. Scudder. And uh, Brett, good to have you back. Good morning, my brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm glad to have you. Know, you know, glad to have you talking about this topic because for everybody, the holidays isn't a good season. We know that more and more people, uh, as the holidays come around, particularly with COVID, really are dealing with depression and what I call seasonal affective disorder. Yes. I mean, before even COVID, it was already a hard time for a lot of people dealing with the, the winter and the holidays mixed together. And now you have COVID joining into that, plus this new Omicron that's causing a whole lot of heightened anxiety in a lot of people. A lot of people feel like their whole you know, holiday, the winter and the season is going to be disrupted by another lockdown, this whole COVID off kick, up tick again. So it's a very frightening time for a lot of people. So what we're asking people to do is to just you know, calm down keep the temperature down, don't focus on the media, don't focus on all the different things that are happening, focus on staying true to yourself, spending time with the family and loved ones, and making sure you get yourself, you know, vaccinated and your health taken care of to be in optimal position to be safe during this time. Let me ask the question about depression. We'll talk from the people who are trying to help one uh, mm -hmm. who may be, or somebody who's actually trying to find out whether I actually am depressed. Uh, and we think that you should automatically know the signs of depression, but how do we know what are the signs of depression? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, it's a great question. I get asked that every day, but it's hard to talk about the signs now when you have COVID and especially everything going on with COVID is throwing so much emotions at a lot of people. Sometimes some people just feel down, lack of lack of energy. They, they don't have this desire to do anything. They're just sad. They're down. They're distressed. They're feeling overwhelmed. But also there are a lot of high functioning people who are depressed and not showing signs of depression because they're very good at what they do. So they target the work or what they have to do and not be focused on the emotions. But it doesn't mean that they're not experiencing depression. It doesn't mean that there aren't signs of depression in them. It's just that they're high functioning and they can redirect a lot of the emotions towards what they're doing and not so much of what they're feeling, but at the same time still experiencing the feelings. Well, we have these feelings and we know that people are definitely dealing with them. The holidays brings out more and more uh, the fact of how people just are not feeling so, uh, you know, yeah. the holiday spirit, if you will, the holiday cheer. Uh, how do we get around this? Well, remember, you know, um, Darren, this holiday season are very emotional holidays. These are about, you know, Thanksgiving is about family, right? Being with family. You have the other traditional holidays, uh, recognizing Hanukkah and I do all, all these different holidays are very emotional. Then you have Christmas, then you have New Year's coming. So it's a very emotional time of holidays that people feel drawn to connectedness, drawn to people, being around people, celebrating all of that. And that's not happening as much this year. 
a lot of people are not going to be doing that. And so what you find is people are just going to be so scared and so concerned about this whole virus. They're withdrawing, they're isolating themselves, they're staying indoors, they're staying by themselves. They don't want to get COVID, they don't want to die, they don't want to be around, you know, all the, and so what you find is that the depression is, creep, depression is creeping into a lot of people out of fear and anxiety. And that's a very bad combination when you look at it. And so what you do is we want people to know that they can reach out, still stay connected. We have this virtual technology, which is a beautiful thing where we can stay connected with each other through technology, video and audio at the same time. So leverage that so that you're not staying home by yourself, grounded in these fears and anxiety and just feeling depressed. There's so many people who are staying at home. And I mean, it's, it's a season where, People are suffering literally in silence. How do we go about helping people who are at home suffering in silence? Normalizing the conversation. Let's normalize the conversation. Let's talk about how you're doing. How are you? How you're feeling? What are you doing? Do you have company? Do you have a support system? Would you like company or do you want to stay by yourself? Just because people are home by themselves doesn't mean that they are always at risk. Some people are okay being alone. The ones who are not, those are the ones that we have to focus on. So what we need to do is normalize the conversation. Where are we talking about it's okay to not be okay, right? Where are we talking to people who are feeling overwhelmed and saying to them, okay, we understand that, but are you okay? You know, you're feeling overwhelmed, you're suffering in silence, you're stressed out. But if you don't want to talk about it, if you're not expressing it, then how are we going to know how to help you? So we have to normalize the conversation, Darren. Listen, I, I've lived with anxiety and depression, uh, PTSD, loneliness for a very long time. I still struggle with some of that every day, especially now during COVID. So for me as a person working in the field, helping people, I too have my own times and days when I, I feel, oh my God, that this is overwhelming. But what do I do? I talk about it. I talk with my um, peers about it. In my listening sessions and our support groups, I even share my own personal experiences with people in our groups. And they're looking at me like, oh my God, if you're going through it, then, hey, I can talk about it. And, you know, so we have to normalize the conversation, let people know that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to talk about you feeling anxious, stressed out, depressed, feeling lonely, feeling like this whole COVID thing is never going to end. I just don't feel like there is no end, you know, just normalizing the conversation and then humanizing what people are feeling, why they're feeling that way. And that is okay. It's a very rough time for all of us right now every one of us yeah and so i know that you also one of the things that you're doing during this time of year is you have a gofundme campaign uh for people who are experiencing financial challenges so let our viewers know a little bit about that yes so our gofundme was set up to also help us um it's you know, we have a lot of people who are reaching out to us who are dealing with mental health challenges stressed out depressed because they're facing challenges of their own not able to afford a lot of things that's going on in their lives right now. And so our GoFundMe is also to help us to keep our operations going um, because we do need the financial support. And so as we continue to maintain our services, offering these free services, helping people 24 sevens, there is a financial burden on us to continue doing that while we're also supporting the people who are in need and how we can help them with the basic needs that they need when they call us and they're like, oh my God, I'm so stressed out. I can't afford food. I can't afford to take care of this. I can't afford this for my children. There's so much going on. We've been able to help out with getting things for people, providing things for them. But right now during this time with over 500% increase in our workload of people calling in in crisis due to COVID, due to the holiday season and the, the myriad of things that are happening. You know, we are in dire need and I do stress on the dire need because if we don't get the financial support, we won't be able to continue doing the services that we're offering. And this is a heightened time for us where we receive a lot of, our, it's the busiest time for us during the year, during these emotional holidays. So really for you, during that time, you see more people than ever before? Yes, because you, you know, think about it, November, Thanksgiving, December, Christmas, New Year's in the end of December, January, then you go right into um, Valentine's Day. So from November to February, not only is it the holiday season, it's also the winter season, all the, all the mix of different emotions. 
it is a time that we've seen uh, we historically for 20 years straight, the highest times of people who are just anxious, they're excited or depressed or stressed out. Yeah. Well, Brett, we got to leave it there. I want to tell people that, uh, you know, you get an opportunity to get connected with you. But thank you for uh, being with us here today and sharing for some much needed information here with us. Thanks a lot, Brett Scudder. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. You take care. Happy holidays to you all. And to, to everyone, again, I just said that, but I want you to think about that for a minute. Happy. A lot of people are not happy. Not everyone is happy. So as you're talking about the holidays, let's not say happy holidays. Let's say I wish you well, wish you the best for the holidays and hope that you are okay for the holidays. Right. Well, I'm wishing you I'm wishing you the best during this holiday season, my Thank brother. You. Thank you. All righty. <laughs> All righty. Well, listen, if you want more information, do us a favor. You can go ahead and visit him at his website, sisfi.org, and follow them on social media at sisfi. We encourage you, please don't go anywhere. We have more open coming up. We return right after this. Back to the show. New Destiny is a not-for-profit organization that is aiming to provide housing and services to the city's most vulnerable homeless populations, victims of domestic violence, and also their children. Now, the need for permanent housing with services is greater than ever, with at least 40% of all homeless families in New York City citing the fact that domestic violence is the cause of their homelessness, an alarming statistic. Joining us now to share more details is the executive director of New Destiny Housing, Nicole Branca, and we thank you so much for being with us. And uh, Nicole, glad to have you. Thank you for having me. You know, as I talked a little bit earlier uh, in the in intro, at least 40% of all homeless families in New York City cite domestic violence as the cause of their homelessness. And, uh, you know, when it comes to your work, uh, that's a startling statistic. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's it's the number one reason why families enter into homelessness in New York City, even above eviction. Mm. And so, and so I'll get, take it away. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's OK. So uh, you know, the city is filled with a lot of really fabulous uh, providers who do work, all sorts of work from um, legal to advocacy uh, to emergency shelter for DV survivors. And where New Destiny comes in is we provide permanent housing. So to, to help DV survivors and their children break the cycle of, of violence and homelessness by having a place to stay for as long as they need it and as long as they want it. And it's all affordable and is uh, adjusted to how much income that they have. And so walk us through a little bit more about the work that you do. Obviously, helping those who are victims of domestic violence are mm -hmm. uh, at the forefront of your services. And so for somebody who may not be so familiar with New Destiny, uh, give us a little bit more of a background. Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, we're a nonprofit based in New York City. We, uh, we were started in 1994 and uh, started, we started out of Safe Horizon, actually. It's a, it's a nice backstory. Um, we started as part of a larger domestic violence organization and really out of the, the, we were grown out of the need for both more shelter and more housing for, for this population. And over time, we spun off onto our own and remained a developer, but switched gears once we realized that there, we needed a permanent solution to break the cycle. And so we focused laser like on building permanent, affordable, and supportive housing and uh, with on site services. So I know your uh, team is familiar with our family support program. And so we, we not only develop these buildings in our community, but then we provide on-site social services to meet the needs of our families, and, and including the moms and the kids, to help them regain stability and um, a sense of hope and a new lease on life. Uh, and then I will say the, the other big component of New Destiny's work is working in the community to help uh, more DV survivors find housing in, in private market and other affordable housing buildings. So. Uh, with almost 19,000 people entering shelter each year because of domestic violence in New York City. Yeah, that's a staggering number. 
We right. can't build our way out of the crisis. Even if there were 10 new destinies in the city or 100 new destinies, we can't build enough housing fast enough. So uh, we also have a, a really dedicated, fabulous team of employees that work with DV survivors to help them find um, Section 8 vouchers or whatever they need to help subsidize their rent and then work with landlords and brokers to find apartments scattered throughout the five boroughs to, to, to live there as well. And then with both our buildings and uh, our programs called Housing Link, aptly named, we link people to housing. Uh, with both programs, we provide services so that, um, you know, uh, most of our families have experienced economic abuse as well as physical abuse. So we do a lot of work on money management and, uh, and then what you would expect with the counseling to get over all the trauma they've experienced, both by being homeless and be, by being abused. Uh, I could go on and on about our services, yeah. but that's, that's your destiny in, in a nutshell. And then we do advocacy work because we need more resources. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to jump in and ask a little question about basically taking things for granted, because sometimes we're on the outside. We don't know. Um, but can you share with us a little bit more about the challenges that possibly families face who have encountered domestic violence and some of the needs that they have? Because many of us will just take it from a blanket approach and say, oh, you're just helping domestic vi violence, you know, people and put them into housing. But there's so much more. And so can you just give us a little bit of what are some of the challenges that we know that people face when they enter into, the, into your, uh, coming through your doors? Yeah, sure. So um, the, you know, you're right. The first thing to do is, is get them safe, right? That's what people think of, get them out of the situation they're in, get them out of shelter, get them into safe housing. And then the work starts, right? So it's, it's creating a new community. DV survivors have, have broken with their abuser and the, the abuser's family and, and oftentimes their circle of friends and are now starting an entirely new life. So all of our buildings, we, we have community space and we create, we have all these events every day so that both the moms and the kids, and I keep saying moms because 96% of DV survivors are, are women, um, that, that they really have an opportunity to, to, to find new friends and rebuild a community. And then in terms of the actual services that we provide and the needs that the survivors have, uh, I mentioned earlier, economic abuse, 99% of our survivors have experienced economic abuse. So we do a lot of money management and job training. Uh, we help them get back into school. We have a lot of our survivors, 75% of our housing is in the Bronx. So a lot of our, um, a lot of our, our moms are going to school at Hostos and Bronx Community College. And we, we, we really try to get them back on track. And then we help with the kids. You know, they were homeless and they were being shuffled from one from their abusive home to a shelter, possibly to another shelter, possibly to a third shelter, they have not been in school. Their education has been deeply disrupted and that's you know, pre-COVID. <laughs> and uh, so we spent a lot of time helping kids get back on an educational path uh, so that they, to really break the cycle, this awful trajectory that they had been on. Um, and then uh, DV survivors have a higher incidence of heart disease, diabetes, um, depression, anxiety, as you would imagine having experienced abuse sometimes for years or decades. So um, they don't, they can't take care of themselves if they're not allowed to go to the doctor, if they're protecting their kids all the time, their self-care is, 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 is completely gone by the wayside. So we connect, we spend a lot of time doing counseling, uh, giving them referrals to local CBOs and, and healthcare settings so that they can get the, the care that they need. Yeah. And then we, we really focus more on wellness. Now that we're learning more about their physical health issues, respect, spending more and more time on health and wellness. Uh, so we're offering yoga classes and meditation and, um, and nutrition counseling. So we're, we really try to, to, to have a holistic trauma-informed approach in all of our um, buildings and programs. So before we go, I want to uh, have an opportunity for you to talk a little bit about the new supportive housing development that's going on right in the borough of the Bronx. Yes, yes, the Cordon. It was uh, formerly known as the Bryant. And last week when we, we opened the building, we renamed it the Cordon after Carol Cordon, who was our executive director for the last 24 years. Um, and uh, the least we could do for somebody who dedicated so much for life to helping DV survivors. Uh, the building is 62 units, 37 of the apartments are set aside for domestic violence survivors and their kids exiting shelter. 
the other apartments are all for very low income households. Um, most of our buildings are in the Bronx. Most of our residents are Bronx residents. So we're particularly excited to be talking on the show. Uh, we have in the space, we have community space. We have a children's playroom. Um, we have the nicest laundry room in the city. You can see it's on the top floor and you can see uh, most of the city from there, a little fun fact. And uh, the building was actually built on city owned land. And as part of it, we, uh, we've been, uh, we have a, a NYCHA basketball court. So we're also helping to redevelop the court so that the kids in the building We'll have a beautiful new basketball court uh, in, a, in a landscape backyard to play. And um, it's in the Longwood section of the Bronx. So it's, it's really nice and we're, um, it's a great, I've only been here a year, so this is my first building and I'm, I'm just thrilled to have, uh, to add this building to the community because it'll be a real anchor of stability. These tenants stay forever and um, they're just so excited to have their own home with their own key and their own, um, their own kitchen. And so uh, we find that our, our buildings, uh, we are spread out in, in most of the city, even though mm -hmm. we're mostly in the Bronx. And we've just found that our, um, our tenants and just make great neighbors. And uh, we're excited to be now in the Longwood. This is our first building in Longwood. So we're very excited to be in the section of the Bronx. Well, glad to have you. And want to let you know that we're excited for what's going on. And thank you for the work that you're doing and really helping a vulnerable population within our community, Nicole. And uh, we thank you for joining us here on Open. Yeah, thank you for calling attention to this issue. Uh, we're glad we can. We're glad we can. All right, for more information, what we encourage you to do is go ahead and visit their website, newdestinyhousing.org. And then also you can check them out on social media and follow them on Twitter at newdestiny.org. Well, New Destiny Org, I should say. All right, we've got more show coming up. Don't go anywhere. Open continues coming up in a few. If you're struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. That's 833-511-0311. And welcome back to the show. Bronx Community College is home to more than 40 academic programs that are actually preparing its students to continue their education at a four-year institution or begin their careers. Now, in addition to their high-quality academic programs, they offer opportunity to learn from outstanding faculty, as well as creating flexible class schedules and growing with the support of the academic community. Here now to share more about what's going on at BCC, we're pleased to be joined by the Director of Admissions at CUNY Bronx Community College, Josh Perez. And uh, Josh, good to have you. Thank you for having me, Darren. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think it's an exciting time for you as well, because as you know, we're, we're talking on one side, you got students who are actually preparing for their finals. But then on the other side, you're also getting ready and gearing up for a new semester where students are actually going to make Bronx Community College their choice. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about this here, because uh, when you look at BCC and the culture of being a community college, why do you feel that people are making BCC that choice? Well, essentially, BCC is one of the true hidden gems in the Bronx, I feel. Um, it's considered a historical landmark, but essentially, we pride ourselves in providing students with the opportunity to have that social and economic mobility within their career of choice. Um, we offer a variety of programs. We are home to over 40 programs, essentially, on our beautiful 45-acre campus. Some of those programs, our most popular, will be liberal arts, criminal justice, business, radiological technology, you have computer science, and even the first cybersecurity associate's degree in CUNY. Um, so we're very excited to offer a multitude of programs to students and essentially ensure that they're able to graduate debt-free. Um, nine, nine out of 10 students at BCC do graduate debt-free, 72% do receive some sort of financial aid along with any additional supports that we have in place. So it's an exciting time to be part of BCC and to be joining us um, as we continue to ramp up kind of welcoming our students back to campus, but also continuing to offer those online modalities. Uh, we actually have a fully online liberal arts degree 
that's excellent. And if people are still kind of in, in rhythm of getting back into the flow of things, we do have that degree, which will give you that great foundation of education, which can then propel you to your four-year school or to your career of choice. So it's a great time to be uh, at BCC. Um, and I'm very excited to lead that charge as a Bronx resident. Um, as you all, some of you may know, over 70% of our students are Bronx residents. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great engine for our community and for students that choose to join BCC. So I'm excited to welcome any and everyone. Registration is open right now. So we are welcoming everyone. Let's not wait till that New Year's resolution starts to kick in. Let's do it now so we can start 2022 on the right foot. I think that you said something that's very key and critical because um, while you're a student and while you're a parent of a student, we know that some parents are going in insurmountable uh, amounts of debt trying to get their child into or their young adult into uh, an educational institution. But I think you, you, you talked about something and I wanna talk about the value of that, which is that most of your students, almost all of your students end up graduating and being debt free. How important is that in the life of a student? Well, essentially, financial literacy is very important. Um, I myself, in going through my college process, there were things and decisions I would have made a bit differently that would have put me in a different economical situation. So that affordability, $2,400 per semester, that's probably one of the cheapest costs you'll get or the cheapest costs you'll get in New York and beyond. So that value of getting this pristine education, on this beautiful campus, 45 acres, um, with the support systems, as you mentioned, like ASAP, like our Access Resource Center, like our Early Childhood Center. Um, these things all help our students move along that path while saving money. So essentially, when you do decide to transfer to your four-year school, you're able to do that debt-free um, instead of kind of dealing with these financial uh, situations you may have to kind of sort through, um, essentially. So. It's a great value. It's a great value of education in a great place, whether you're from the Bronx or not from the Bronx. Please come join us because you make that right. Uh, you can make a quick turn on University Avenue and you're literally in this collegiate play. It's a, a very collegiate feel. Um, you know, I even say the air is different at BCC. It just feels great. Um, so it's a great place to be. Um, and that value is undeniable. Um, cost is something that people tend to attach to things, but hey, let's save money while getting that great education. That, that's a, a very big thing in our community. And one of our, my goals is to essentially provide that financial education as I sit with students and kind of going down that path of, hey, if you're able to complete this degree within this amount of time at this cost, you know, the, the savings are unbelievable where you can take that money and now invest it into your business idea or into your, you know, into your family or anything of that sort. Um, we're always trying to find ways to help our students get to that end goal. Over 75% of students do transfer on to their four-year schools. So we're looking for results. The numbers and the proof is right in the pudding. Um, so things like our early childhood center, I feel are crucial because as students want to gain that value of education, as you said, they're juggling a lot of things right now. And our Early Childhood Center provides childcare as our students right. attend school. Um, and essentially their, their child gets to attend an accredited preschool. So we're kind of tapping on each generation within the families and essentially hoping that we see those results all through BCC. Yeah, so honestly for you, uh, we talked a little earlier, you're seeing more and more students come through your doors. Most of them are really Bronx students, uh, I mean Bronx residents. Let's talk about this for a minute, because one of the values I think that you talked about in your education program is the fact that you have relevant uh, majors. And when we talk about cybersecurity, this is something that's very real, but yet and still you offer coming through the door. Um, how important do you think it is for a student that makes that decision to be able to latch on to these relevant programs that are really you know, front and center right now? Well, as we see the, the past few years have kind of put things in perspective for everyone, um, cybersecurity is one thing that as we all are on our computers much more and utilizing technology much more, cybersecurity becomes a much higher demand. So connecting students to those kind of skills 
and then essentially that data and saying, hey, in a few years, you can be making over $70,000 in the cybersecurity field. Um, if you join the radiological technology program, you could be at 65,000 um, a year in salary. So essentially health has become a very important thing to our community. And I feel BCC has become the leader in that charge. Our nursing program is ranked number one in the Bronx by RN Careers and essentially 34th overall. So we're kind of grooming these uh, health, you know, these health officials, these health educators, um, these people that are change agents within our community, essentially. So even our medical lab technician program, you know, these are people on the forefront who are learning how to tackle diseases and things of that sort. So we are grooming students and connecting them to the right programs. And essentially with supports like the Accelerated Studies and Associates program, ASAP, connecting them to mentors, proper scheduling, financial support, students are able to essentially focus on their studies and graduate in a career that is going to be, a, you know, see an immediate return on investment for them. Before we leave, Josh, I know the registration is taking place for uh, the 2022 semester. So please let our viewers know how they can still register uh, and the deadline for which they can apply. Yes, so registration is currently open. Classes do begin on January 28th. I'm a believer in the early bird gets the worm. The sooner we get to this, the sooner you can celebrate with your family, get your acceptance letter in the mail and join the Bronco family. If you are interested, you can reach us at 718-289-5895. You can also email us at admissions at bcc.cuny.edu. That is A-D-M-I-S-S-I-O-N-S -S -S at bcc.cuny.edu. Feel free to reach out to us. You can ask for me personally if you would like to chat with me. My, I have a huge open door policy, so I would like to welcome any and everyone to the Bronco family. So please reach out to us and let's get you enrolled for that spring semester of 2022. Well, Josh, great talking to you. Want you to have happy holidays. I know it's an exciting time for you at BCC as you're getting ready for that 2022 class. And for those that actually be graduating uh, at the end of this semester, Josh Fresh, thank you so much for being with us here on Open. Thank you so much, Darren. It's been a pleasure. And take care and have a great holiday. All righty. Make sure you wish my president a, a very happy holidays, too. I very good man, President Sikadegby. I definitely will. You are, I've heard that you're part of the BCC family, so I will definitely send him the love. All right. Yeah, I am. I am. Listen, <laughs> and for more information, we encourage you, visit the website for BCC at bcc.cuny.edu. And then also follow them on Twitter and Instagram at bccuny. Listen, we got more information for you. We got a great show coming up ahead. Stay with us. Open continues coming up right after this. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. Well, it's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. And welcome back. When you're thinking about self-care, it could be defined by the term itself, right? Caring for yourself. But practicing self-care isn't always easy. And most of us are crazy, busy, stressful. we got a whole lot of stuff happening in our lives and sometimes consumed by technology and really don't have time to make time for ourselves. Well, there are some things that you can do to engage in self-care and joining us now to share a little bit more and provide some tips is the author and the relationship expert, Shantae L. Dunbar. And uh, Shantae, good to have you. Hi, nice to be back. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. Good to have you during this time of year. And, uh, you know, we'll first kick it off talking a little bit about self-care. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think for a lot of people, um, it's the last thing that we do because we're so busy helping others. Yeah, that's how it works. Like I always ask people like make a list of, you know, what you love 
And then when they finish with the list, I'm like, and did you put yourself on the list? And everybody's like, oh, or they're not the first thing that they write on the list. So yeah, it's important. And we're so busy, like you said, helping others. We put ourselves on the back burner, but you can't get from an empty cup. So you have to learn how to take care of yourself. True indeed, true indeed. So what are some of the best things that we can do when we're talking about practicing self-care? I think one of the greatest things to do is to have a clean home and organize your space, right? I feel like that makes you just a little bit more comfortable and able to relax. I think it's important to get your sleep. You know how when you're, you know, trying to accomplish things, people are like, oh, you got to be on your grind. No sleep. That's for suckers. You know, and you're like, right. really? Like, I can't function on less than six hours of sleep. Like, what good am I to others if I'm cranky, right? Mm -hmm. You also got to make sure you're eating healthy, right? And you're exercising. And even if it's just taking a walk or, you know, just, you know, reading a book or maybe taking some kind of yoga class or something. Like, these little things can make a big impact but you don't have to feel pressured and overwhelmed. Like, I'm going to do self-care today. And then it's like, you're stressed out about doing self-care. Like, that don't make sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to move a little bit. I want to move a little bit over to another topic and talk a little bit about the end of the year is coming, right? And people are yeah. trying to like, you know, clean house, talk about cleaning house a little while. But, but talk to me about this thing about these toxic friendships and relationships, because I know that, you know, Part of self-care is getting rid of that. Yeah, you definitely have to clean them out, right? Those friends who are not supporting you and, you know, think that you're trying to accomplish or maybe they're being fake about it and then they're gossiping about you behind your back. Um, they don't respect your boundaries. They, you know, make you feel uncomfortable. You know you have a toxic friend where you feel like you have to filter yourself around mm -hmm. certain people like if I and know I can't have this conversation or I have to say it in a way because I know you're gonna run tell that that's not a good person to keep in your circle you know right and so mm -hmm. what's what's how do you get rid of them I guess the, the, because if it was so easy to do everybody would do it right but what's some of the best ways that we could do that I mean one of the things is to start setting some boundaries with this person right and not only setting them, but you respecting them as well. Because if you don't respect your boundaries, no one else is going to. So maybe you limit the time that you spend with this person. Maybe you don't answer every call and that's okay. People will start to wean themselves off of you when they realize they don't have any like control over you the way they used to, or you're acting funny, right? They never look at their own behavior as to what did I do to make this person behave this way? It's always, you know, oh, you're being weird. But, you know, when people learn that they don't have that access to you, they back away. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about this and you talk about these toxic relationships, talk about toxic friendships, as we get ready to approach the new year, we know that people are trying, still looking for love. And there's no way that I'm letting you off the hook without talking about this look of love thing. So talk to us about, you know, dating during this time. What, what, do, you, what, what, what do you want to tell us? One thing I would definitely say is pace yourself, right? Don't be comparing yourself to these people on social media. <laughs> For the gram, I promise you, right? It's not always, you know, bubbles and just glitter all the time. And, uh, you know, realize that you, you have to heal and you have to be whole before you enter into something. So do it because you're ready, not because it's the holidays and people are wearing matching pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, they look so good together. I mean... Why well, I should just, and before you know what, you got yourself in a situation that you wish that you hadn't, like, yeah, exactly. I get it. I yeah. know it's cuffing season, but everybody calm down, right? Yeah, to, to, to bring it down a thousand, right? I, I, I like that, totally. Bring it down a thousand. <laughs> Listen, uh, tell people, I, I mean, if people want to follow you on the gram, I think it's very, you know, your work, I told you off camera, and I'll tell you again, I think your work is really, you know, from the actress to the laughter to the reality, you just bring it all together. So, so talk to us a little bit about what you're doing right now and how people can check you out. 
So right now, my focus is actually self-care Sunday. So you can check me out on diving in stilettos first, underscore under each name on Instagram. And every Sunday, I'm doing a cool video to show you how to just love on yourself. I just bought like this like weighted hula hoop thing. And I'm like a hula hoop fanatic now. I can't stop doing it. But, you know, for me, it's about making things fun while you do healthy things. So <clears throat> that's my main thing right now. Also, I'm, you know, promoting my film. So I've been entering it in a lot of film festivals. I won an award for it. And I'm going to start pitching it soon, you know, to be a series. So I'm super excited about all of that. So just make sure you follow on Instagram because I, I keep everybody updated there. So you've taken what you've done, really, and you've really blown it up. I mean, literally. What was the key for you in terms of really taking it to the next level? Because we've been doing this for years now. And every every time we get back, it's something new, it's something higher, it's something better. So what's been the key for you? I am uh, taking the opportunity and running with it. Like, and I'm not going to stop until I reach the ultimate goal, which is, you know, sipping champagne on a yacht carefree with just money constantly coming into my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. While well, I'm sleeping, making the money, right? That's, that's every person's, you know, every person's dream. But for you, honestly, what advice would you give people as we approach the new year, uh, whether it's uh, in the area of relationship or also, you know, as we're talking about also self-care? Because the holidays are right here. And, you know, sometimes we're bringing people to the family outing and we really shouldn't. Give me, give me that. You know, you know exactly where I'm going. You really shouldn't. And let me tell you something. When you bring new people to these places and it's time to take family photos, that person should take the photo, okay? Don't, <laughs> don't be jumping in people's family photos. We're not sure about you yet. Everybody calm down, okay? Right. <laughs> That's important. But my main thing now for the holiday season is find your peace of mind because when the mind goes, you've got nothing left. So do whatever it is that's going to make you happy, zen, feeling good about yourself and, you know, pay it forward. Like if something good happens to you, do something nice for somebody else. That's like the holiday spirit. So keep it going. Yeah, keep it going. I got one more question you're going to answer real quickly for me. Talk to me about what are some of the quick ways that somebody can set a boundary? Oh, well, there's six kinds of boundaries, right? So there's your physical, your time, sexual boundaries, intellectual materials. And um, if you say, I don't speak to people after 11 o'clock, don't answer your phone after 11 o'clock, right? If you say, don't go in my refrigerator when you come to my house, <laughs> tell people don't go into your refrigerator. It's more about communicating more than anything else. And, you know, like I said, respect your own boundaries because if you don't, no one will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one will. It's been great having you. You too. Thanks for having me. This was amazing. Shantae Dunbar. Well, for more information, you can visit her website at divinginstilettos.com and then also email her at first at gmail.com. Well, let you know, we come to the end of our show today. We want to thank our guests for joining us. But most of all, I want to thank you, the viewer, for watching. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, don't worry. You can catch Recablecast again on Bronx Test Channel 67. Also, you have Verizon Files Channel 2133, or you're encouraged anytime that you can watch us on the web at www.bronxnet.org. Also, we want to thank our guests who've been watching on Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is broadcast live simultaneously on the MNN channel. Now, if you desire a brand new, fresh episode of Open, what can you do? Well, you can come back on Friday morning. My girl, Rena Valentine, she'll bring you the best in arts and entertainment, keeping it real, and bring you some exciting topics to talk about and to learn from. All right, I'm Darren Jaime saying thank you for watching for this Wednesday Open, also seen on Thursday. Take care, God bless, and most of all, keep this channel wide open.